just want to wholeheartedly welcome all of you to this event, uh, looking at the untapped role of fungi in sustainability. My name is Danielle Stevenson. I'm an applied mycologist. I've been working on applications for fungi and food systems in sustainable agriculture, uh, as well as in alternatives to waste management and to microremediation. So I'm currently working on a PhD studying microremediation at the University of California, Riverside. And it is my great pleasure to have the opportunity today to uh, help moderate this panel. And uh, I'm, I could not be more excited to learn from these incredible leaders uh, from uh, MycoCycle addressing waste, from MycoLogos uh, helping spread, uh, you know, information and awareness about the amazing potential of fungi. Um, we have uh, Plenitude and Ecovative and Fungal Architectures. Uh, we have the opportunity to learn about these ways that fungi are being right now today applied uh, to advance sustainability by creating replacements uh, to plastics and building materials and clothing uh, to even contributing to computation systems, creating sustainable protein sources and, and so much more. So we really want this to be a space where you can ask questions and learn. So uh, just to go through quickly the, um, the plan for today, uh, we'll start with some opening remarks, introducing the subject, uh, and then we'll have a chance to uh, listen to each of the speakers uh, shown here one by one. And then after that, we're going to move into a panel in which uh, we're going to prioritize your questions. So uh, when we get to the panel, I'll provide more instruction. But what we'd like is for you to pop your questions into the chat so you can type them into the chat at that time. I'll look through and share your questions with the panel uh, so that we have a chance to um, learn, you know, learn more and, and, and address some of your questions. And then we'll have closing remarks from Peter McCoy. So first of all, what is sustainability? So sustainability is often defined based on um, the you know, UN definition. It's about meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And uh, there are these three major pillars of sustainability, one being the environment, that one uh, is straightforward. The other is the economy. And finally, society or equity. Um, so we know that many of the great challenges uh, that we're facing globally in sustainability are not evenly distributed in terms of who is producing uh, the greatest impacts and who is uh, affected and most impacted. Um, so the equity piece is incredibly important as well. And so what are the issues in sustainability that uh, fungi have the potential to, to help address? So first of all, pollution, this is a big one. You may know um, that what we're seeing here is uh, an aerial image of the oil sands in, in Canada, uh, where I'm from. Uh, so pollution of the air, of the water, and of the land and soil is a major issue uh, globally all around the world, and something that we can absolutely work with fungi to help address. Climate change is a major sustainability challenge. So uh, some of the effects of climate change include rising sea levels, uh, pollution as well is tied in, increased spread of, of pollution. Um, we have increasing temperatures, uh, so increasing global temperatures. We're losing biodiversity, so species uh, are dying if they cannot adapt to this changing climate. Um, you know, we have melting glaciers 
and uh, so many you know, other issues from increased drought and increased flooding, increased extreme weather events, uh, and so much more. So climate change is a major issue that is interconnected with a lot of sustainability challenges, including feeding the world and um, energy production and materials production and uh, natural resource use. So building on that, of course, um, there isn't enough food access especially regarding protein. Access to clean water is a major issue globally as well. And waste is a major issue, as I'm sure you're aware. We produce a lot of products with short shelf lives and long half lives in the environment. So we produce stuff that uh, sticks around for a long time and is a source of pollution. And um, I really love thinking of waste as a misplaced resource. So uh, I think it was Daniel Freitag that said, um, you know, you change the context and you have a product, uh, not a waste, not a problem. Um, and, you know, within that waste issue, that overall bigger issue, of course, plastics are a major portion of global waste, a major issue to resolve for a sustainable future. And so now I let's switch over to the fungi here. So this is a quote from Understories uh, by SNS Gilbert that I just love. They say, the organisms becoming emblematic of the Anthropocene are fungi. They're emblems of resourcefulness and regeneration. They know how to play with others to form holobionts and can live at the extremes and in depleted environments. As the extreme becomes the new normal, we behold fungi. And so what is the potential uh, to apply mycology to address these sustainability issues? So as we'll learn about today, there's potential to divert certain waste such as agricultural waste from the landfill as substrates to grow these protein rich mushrooms as a food source. There's potential to work with fungi to remediate and restore contaminated or polluted sites. We can replace toxic and environmentally costly materials and products with fungal materials and we can reduce the toxicity of polluting waste and create new materials inputs that are more sustainable. And we can even uh, work with fungi for com computing and, and as biosensors. This is just incredibly exciting. And so with that, uh, again, welcome. This is an exciting time and an exciting panel. And so we'll now pass over to Phil Ayers who will talk about the amazing work they're doing with uh, regards to fungal materials and building and computation with their uh, project, Fungal Architectures. So Phil. Thanks, Daniela. Um, I'll just try and get to share the screen here. So can, can, you, can you see the uh, presentation? Brilliant, thank you. So uh, um, th thank you very much for the uh, invitation to Luke. So on, you know, on behalf of the consortium, you know, we'd like to thank uh, Luke and the co-organizers for the invitation to come and share this work and in this forum. And uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Daniel. So the Fungal Architectures Project, um, in brief, uh, this is an EU funded project uh, funded by the Future and Emerging Technologies program. It has four European partners, three of which are academic, and we have one industry partner, Mogu. It's a three and a half year long project uh, and was awarded 2.9 million euros. Um, to give a little bit of context for the project, um, I mean, the, the, the world of mycelium based composites is a really active and exciting research space. Uh, we see the kind of trend of interest growing over the last 10 years in terms of uh, research output, as we see on the left. Um, and on the right here, uh, this is a mapping of a kind of diversification of approaches that we're seeing in mycelium-based um, 
production within an architectural context. Um, and, and this is really uh, focused on speculative architectural investigations. Um, to, to broaden that context then into the kind of issues surrounding the built environment and architecture, uh, and to try and understand a key driver for this focused interest in mycelium-based composites. I think this is driven by this idea of wanting to explore new material pathways towards improving our sector's environmental impact cred credentials. So we see the problem here on the left, where at, a, at an EU scale, uh, the built environment um, is really responsible for half of all raw materials consumed, a third of fresh water used. It's a, a massive generator of waste. And as we move towards a more global perspective, and we look at both um, energy in terms of production and also operational costs, we see that the built environment really is a, is a major contributor and, and produces a huge impact. And then on the right hand side, if we look at this in, re in relation to the kind of given pro projection of material consumption over the coming 40 years, we can see how necessary it is that we begin to diversify um, our, our material base, especially when we correlate this with projections showing that the limits of resources are going to run out long before we even reach the possibility of doubling our use of these materials. And so th this really points to the fact that the built environment can be seen as a leverage point uh, in terms of um, questions of uh, climate change and sustainability. Um, but it also implies that we need to change, not just in terms of our material basis, but also how we construct, how we inhabit, and what values we actually embody in our built environment. So this sets the scene for the uh, fungal architectures project where we're investigating four particular threads here. Um, the fascination really that this is a new material, uh, new material processes. And this leads to the idea that perhaps not, not just thinking just materially, but how might this lead also to new architecture, new architectural construction techniques, but also new architectural expressions that embody new ethics and new values. So in our research, we, we've been looking at a material perspective, um, starting to look at how it is that substrate composition might be a vector for introducing uh, design and the tuning of functional properties. So we see here how we're starting to consider the bulk volume as something that can be variegated uh, with different particulate sizes, but also with oriented fibers. Uh, and in a recently published paper of ours, showing how it is that through this kind of um, compositional method, we can start to actually drive the envelope of performance for mycelium-based composites. You see um, our plotting here that starts to kind of move up in terms of the elastic modulus uh, given this particular density. From a computational perspective, and this, this really draws upon work from our partner in uh, the unconventional computing lab, Andrew Adamatsky, and his prior work looking at the idea of how it is that we can embody um, logic within the topology of networks of living organisms. Uh, we've, we've been looking at a kind of theoretical understanding of being able to work with um, confocal microscopy uh, data from our partners, University of Utrecht, building three-dimensional graphs of these networks to, to try and mine their topology for introducing um, functional circuit designs. Uh, now, of course, this is somewhat theoretical, um, I would say, but certainly theoretically plausible, uh, whereas uh, practically it's quite difficult to implement. Um, so from Andy's lab, this work um, starting to show how it is that fungus can discriminate between different environmental inputs really provides a much more feasible entry into architectural integration. So from an architectural perspective, we've been starting to look at the role of morphology uh, or shape, architectural shape as a way of interfacing with that environment and starting to think about the placement of, of living mycelium as a way of being able to generate certain kinds of stimuli. From our construction um, concept, uh, we're looking at the idea of using Kagomi weaving 
as a way of creating a stay in place mold and reinforcement for our uh, mycelium composites. And the reason for that is um, Kagomi or triaxial weaving offers a very principled approach to being able to achieve um, almost any uh, morphology, uh, high genus, uh, highly complex, double curvature, and all producible with straight strips of material, which makes it a very rationalized method of production. So we're looking at how it is that we can begin to scale this up, how we can transfer these weaving understandings into load bearing um, grid shells, and also um, how it is that we start to uh, create a more nuanced understanding between elements that are load bearing and where it is that we can start to grow mycelium in monolithic configurations across surfaces. Um, so this starts to lead towards um, this as a set of, sorry, this as a set of um, explorations um, where we have um, the idea of these Kagomi weaves acting as uh, both principal structure, but also as surfaces for mycelium to be able to colonize, uh, to be able to create architectural enclosure. And then we begin to speculate about the kind of expressions of this architecture, uh, which um, here, uh, this is uh, quite a speculative um, proposition, um, yet to be informed perhaps by particular uh, design um, objectives, uh, but it starts to give a kind of indication of what we're trying to achieve in terms of creating an identity that sits poised between an idea of landscape um, poised between an idea of landscape and building or between culture and unruly wilderness. Um, the, these, these are qualities that we're really enjoying working with, with, with the fungus. And, and in many ways, this starts to kind of bring us around full circle to perhaps um, architectural interests from the mid 19th century, where we see here um, renditions of uh, John Soane's architecture where he was very interested in the idea of an architecture um, that he was currently building the Bank of England and projecting it as a ruin. Uh, and this, this is a very non-modernist idea, but I think it starts to find a very contemporary um, resonance with the idea that we're using fungi at one scale that are involved in the decay and the ruination of material to create positive materials with structural performance at a different scale. Um, and so that's where uh, I think we'll leave it. And just to say thank you um, and, and, and to kind of give voice to all the people that are involved in the project from uh, the, the consortium. And perhaps also just to point to uh, the Fungar website, um, which is here, uh, where you can find, particularly in the dissemination section, um, a, a listing of uh, all the papers that have been currently published. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Phil, uh, for speaking to us about fungal architectures. What an incredible consortium, what incredible work. Uh, so yeah, please, you know, think of any questions you'd like to ask Phil and save them for the panel discussion portion. Uh, so at this point, we are honored to now introduce Joanne Rodriguez from MicroCycle. And uh, so Joanne, I was thinking I'll share your website. How about that as a background? Okay. That would be fine. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you, Danielle. Um, and uh, yes, I'm Joanne Rodriguez. I'm the CEO of MicroCycle. And uh, we are headquartered outside of Chicago, Illinois. Um, and you can see right there, imagine a world without waste. That's the direction of our organization. Um, I spent decades in construction materials production. Uh, 16 of those years, I was working for a commercial manufacturer of building products, everything from below grade waterproofing to the roof over your head. And um, as a director of sustainable and strategic initiatives for them, came to realize kind of what we knew, but it wasn't really ever apparent that most of what we made or went into a building ended up in landfill or incineration. Um, and it wasn't just a problem that 
our organization had, it was a problem that the industry had. And so um, that inspired me to move into a direction of uh, pursuit of a solution uh, to try to figure out alternative routes for um, waste streams and figure out some way to minimize that impact. And so um, I started MycoCycle, which is a process that we license um, to uh, remove toxins from high volume waste streams, particularly those in the construction and demolition sector, um, create new bio-based raw materials and reduce greenhouse gases. And so why are we doing this? Um, other, I think Phil touched on some of this at the outset, but if you think about this, we generate um, almost 600 million tons of construction and demolition waste in the United States alone. Uh, that number is double all of the municipal solid waste that gets um, created. We don't talk about construction and demolition waste with such an urgency as we do other waste streams. It's probably not as glamorous. It's a little bit more complex. And I think it takes a diversity of backgrounds to understand the issue. Um, and why this is problematic is that the, the waste industry is responsible for roughly 16% of all man-made methane gas being released into the environment. Uh, landfills are overflowing, especially construction and demolition landfills, which are on the precipice of closing. There are some major municipalities that will have their construction and demolition landfills closed by the end of this year. Uh, their entire um, provinces in Canada, for instance, in Quebec that are starting to ban these types of material from landfilling. And so what all of that will do is inspire um, greater greenhouse gases in the transportation sector as these materials get moved further and further away, um, or they'll get dumped illegally. And all of this is a human and environmental health concern. So what we see happening on the flip side that I think Phil outlined uh, very um, accurately is the amount of carbon that's produced in construction and building materials. In the built environment, um, materials are, rough, are responsible for roughly 11% of all CO2e. So the way that I see our position in this as a connector, um, adding collaboration, just harnessing that power of fungi, is to drive a new circular bioeconomy. Um, and when we think about recycling, there's uh, those systems fail because there's not an economic value uh, to the waste stream, right? And so repositioning all of this at, with waste as a resource allows us to move into this direction. So I think in context, ta I've talked about the problem that we're solving, but where are we going? Um, we're creating these new bio-based raw materials. We like the raw material sector because we feel like we can move the needle a little bit quicker a little bit easier uh, to re replace some of the petrochemicals that go into products like in uh, concrete, into new insulation boards, um, into fabrics and foams and, and fibers. Uh, we're looking really hard at the calcium carbonate um, market as a replacement potential for our byproduct. And the reason why we like that is because we don't have to be as clean in our process, right? Fungi operate in nature. They don't operate necessarily in a clean environment. And so we're replicating that and really leaning into this uh, idea that we don't have to have a pristine environment to be able to treat waste in, in, in our controls. And so uh, we're looking at an easy button for waste management that would allow us to treat a diversity of waste streams. Um, and quite frankly, by the end of this summer, we will have treated over 10,000 pounds of uh, materials in the field and anything from SBR crumb rubber to asphalt roof uh, tear off materials to gypsum drywall. And so we've been able to vet this um, as a value stream on the front end and, and our processes, it will now be creating the end use value through the bioeconomy to say this is the, the replacement. And with that, we're bringing manufacturers to the table um, with every project that we have so that they conduct, conduct R&D on the byproducts. So it doesn't it allows us to walk before we can run. Uh, you know, uh, it allows us to address issues of scalability. Uh, people will say, well, how can you just put a brand new building product out there? And I'm sure Phil and his team has seen that and Gavin and his team at Ecovative as well. 
Um, and I would come back to challenge, you know, we didn't take a tree from the forest and it automatically became a wood fiber board or some building product that there was a product development path that happened. And so we're trying to approach it in that manner to say, you know, we could do this one step at a time and um, increase and improve the reuse of these materials that would sit without value for 400 years or more polluting our environment. The goals of our company, um, big picture, are to treat 1.5 um, million tons of waste in, uh, in five years, and by 2030 to reduce carbon um, emissions by one gigaton. And that would be a total impact on the, the treatment side of diverting waste from landfill and the uh, replacement side of our new um, microfibers or microfill into new products. And so I think, you know, I, part of this, and, and Luke had asked us to really think about what uh, this, this audience can do, like what can we do in terms of the, the social impact or the impact of those embracing um, microremediation and mycology, I, I would just say, you know, continue to share and in the spirit of collaboration, um, be curious and interested in this. I come at this from a completely different background. I'm a citizen scientist um, and, and a business person. And I think we have to definitely continue to embrace, embrace um, a diversity of backgrounds, a diversity of conversations, uh, we have to look at, and I know this might rub some purists wrong, but we have to look at how we monetize and create economic value from uh, microremediation, applied mycology, and, um, and micro-materials. Like, I think we have to continue to tell the stories and, um, and present art and vision statements about it, but we have to also show it growing in these economic markets. Uh, because I, I personally believe, um, as everybody on this panel does, that mycelium and um, mycology are the key to climate change. Uh, it's the only way we're going to stop um, what is the self-fulfilling prophecy of waste management um, with greater uh, greenhouse gas release. We fuel the climate uh, to where we have these tremendous weather events, the tremendous weather events create uh, floods and, and um, tornadoes and hurricanes, you name it, it creates more debris. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that needs some innovation for us to break. So um, for me, I'm looking for collaboration partners uh, in this audience. Um, we're looking for ideas, places that we haven't gone. Um, our team is very hardworking, but we don't have all the answers. And so we welcome the diversity of opinions. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and discuss it. You know, I, we have a platform that allows for a lot of um, microremediation specialists and scientists to enter in. Globally, we're working with scientists like Dr. Katarina Trono in Poland, uh, Dr. Flor in Mexico, um, soon to be Dr. Stevenson, uh, uh, Daniel Reyes. I even had the opportunity to work with Peter McCoy. And, um, and we're getting validation from national labs like the Department of Energy with our inclusion into their chain reaction innovation, where I'll be working with uh, Dr. Meltem Demirtis. And so um, it's an all hands on deck effort. And that would be my, my ask and my message to this group here, that as we uh, disrupt not one, but two innovation um, industries uh, at, to the benefit of human and environmental health using microremediation of mycelium that uh, we continue to gain the encouragement and support um, of the community. Everybody has been so, so good to us so far, but, um, I, I just want to continue that and, and open our doors and say the ideas are welcome. And uh, just thank you very much for allowing us to speak today. Thank you so much, Joanne, for sharing the just incredible leadership MycoCycle is offering in, in this space. Thank you. And so uh, with that, we'll invite Gavin McIntyre from one of the co-founders of EcoVitip 
to share a bit about the incredible uh, replacement materials, foods, so much more that Ecovative is developing and offering. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Danielle, and many thanks to Luke and the conference organizers for inviting me and the Ecovative team to share a bit more about our organization and uh, our efforts in making some meaningful progress against some of these global or planetary challenges. And so at Ecovative, what we do is we focus on designing and growing better materials using mycelium. And as we've been hearing today, mycelium is the fibrous or vegetative tissue of mushrooms. Uh, oftentimes it's found growing in all of the world's ecosystems, both inside trees and under the forest floor. And in our mycelium foundry and vertical farms, we've engineered unique growth conditions to influence the growth of mycelium into large, interwoven and continuous sheets, which we turn into high quality biomaterials and delicious and nutritious foods. Mushrooms and fungi have so much to do with sustainability. They aren't just sustainable. They are actually what sustains life as we know it today. In the forest, mycelia are constantly working to cycle organic material into the raw materials for new life. They shuttle nutrients between plants and animals and microbes, basically stitching entire ecosystems together. And as one mycologist has put it, fungi are like the egg within the cake. Uh, with that in mind, it's perhaps no surprise that various strains of mycelium are actually able to provide super useful, durable materials that are compatible with our planet at the end of their life. We think of what we do as being deeply rooted in the forest. We're constantly trying to reconnect the way we make things uh, to the way that nature actually works. This is part of what we call internally the forager secret, which is the idea that pretty much everything that we need is already out there in the woods, uh, some of which we are only now starting to unlock thanks to advances in mycelium technology, like we've heard earlier. In fact, many of the mushrooms that we work with we've actually foraged from the woods not too far from our headquarters here in upstate New York. And over time, we've built a pretty vast library of strains that we use as we tap into and then develop and test new materials and products. The ideal outcome for our technology would be to be using native strains from the regions in which our facilities are operating, tapping into local agricultural commodities and uh, ecosystems, which means that we can provide regenerative manufacturing uh, that is tied directly to local economies and ecosystems. Uh, this has been the case for some of the sensitive ecosystems that our partners work in today in countries that have very uh, stringent biosecurity measures and with good reason. Uh, this includes one of our protective packaging partners, which is located in New Zealand, Biofab. Uh, back in 2007, uh, Ecovative actually introduced our first commercial material, uh, which was mushroom packaging. And though 15 years can seem like a long time, we're still really in the early days of what I think will be a revolutionary era for earth-friendly biomaterials. Um, from day one, our mission has always been to improve legacy industries with the worst environmental impact, especially fossil fuels and factory farming. Uh, but it isn't enough just to use less. We need to really fundamentally shift entire industries toward sustainability. And for us, that means proving and providing alternatives that are better than the status quo. Our approach has always been to upcycle local waste streams from agriculture, transforming them into higher value mycelium materials for food, plastic foam alternatives, and leather-like hides. In a way, this actually reflects the role, of course, of fungi in the woods, where they transform old leaves and debris into new life. Through comprehensive compostability trials that assess not only a material's ability to disintegrate, but also the effects the resulting compost has on soil health and plant cultivation, we know that our mycelium products are truly circular. Uh, what if big, complex industries like fashion and apparel could actually play a positive role in sustaining those same cycles of life? At Ecovative, we truly believe that this isn't just possible, but it's also urgently necessary. And we see mycelium as one of the great opportunities to get there. And that's why late last year, we launched Forager, which is our division focused on mycelium-based soft goods, like this elastomeric foam here, and including things like leather, technical insulation, and elastomeric foams to replace the plastic, scrap, chemicals, and other unsustainable aspects of the fashion and apparel industries. 
Forger is literally growing the next generation of materials for this industry with true circularity as our driving goal and mission. Um, our technology is built upon what's known as solid state fermentation, basically a high tech version of mushroom cultivation. And our first technology is what we call mycocomposite. This is the base technology for mushroom packaging, which is a material that directly replaces polystyrene or the plastic films used in transport. Using mycelium as a kind of active glue, it binds together feedstocks like wood chips, as an example, uh, that then these then go into serving a wide range of industries, inclusive e-commerce for fashion and personal care. Over the last decade and a half, these products have been able to scale globally, competing with plastic foams, and their success has led to a network of licensing partners uh, that are currently growing our mycocomposite products on three distinct continents. For us, success means displacing greater and greater amounts of unsustainable materials and practices like plastics and factory farming. Uh, we want our materials to emerge from nature and then merge back with nature once they're done with their useful life cycle. And that's how we start a cycle anew. At Ecovative, we've really always known that the greatest potential uh, for us is within pure mycelium. And so just over 10 years ago, we started to develop the Air Mycelium platform, which produces 100% pure mycelium materials, which are free of binders, chemicals, fossil fuels, additives, and anything else that could potentially harm our planet. Uh, this process takes place naturally. Uh, by tuning the microscopic mycelium threads to bind and weave themselves into complex three-dimensional structures with all sorts of useful properties involving far less embodied energy than conventional animal agriculture or plastic foams. It also enables performance points that sometimes aren't otherwise possible. For instance, we can create a very breathable and flexible thermal insulation that can be competitive with conventional goose down. We first brought this product to market uh, using our uh, for food in our My Bacon strips uh, almost two years ago, and that product is currently commercially available in the American Northeast. And now we're focused on addressing factory farms byproducts, specifically the animal hides and skins that are sold into secondary as secondaries to meat production. Uh, when it comes to things like leather, the uh, primary source of hides today is unsustainable factory farming, which can fuel deforestation and requires an immense amount of water, arable land, and food, which we believe could be put to better use elsewhere. Tanning these byproducts from animal agriculture can also be reliant upon toxic chemistries if they're not properly discarded. And so with Forager, none of that is necessary. For instance, today we're able to grow an alternative for a wet blue uh, that a tannery can take just like a cowhide but without the need for caustic chemicals like lime or chromium. In just a matter of days, we can grow an individual sheet of mycelium that's larger than four cowhides put together using a fraction of the water and energy inputs. And so today we grow sheets of mycelium that are 1.6 meters in width by over 10 meters in total length. And we're increasing that scale, uh, as I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, growing a hide with intention also limits the tremendous amount of scrap and therefore the chemical reliance associated with these animal byproducts. Uh, we are actively collaborating with tanneries and chemistry companies to develop the right suite of dyeing processes that are perfectly aligned with our values and intentions to bring our forager materials to market. This includes limiting the plastics that are common in bio-based textiles, including animal leather. Um, many people are actually surprised by how much plastic goes into even leather products today, typically for finishing applications. And then if we look at the elastomeric foams that provide the support and everything from footwear to jackets and handbags, uh, plastics are almost universal in these applications. In addition to leather-like hides, Forger produces completely plastic-free alternatives to these foams. Of course, nothing in fashion is ever really made out of a mono material. They're often amalgams of lots of different materials, which make them difficult to reclaim or recycle at the end of their useful life. So in the near term, our goal is to displace as much plastic and other sustainable aspects of these products as possible. Whether it's for remediation or for mass market biomaterials, for any of this to make a difference, scale is absolutely key. So with many moving parts behind every product, uh, it really requires collaborative efforts, as we've heard earlier in the panel today, to combine these learnings and accelerate adoption. 
the applications for mycelium are really exciting, but unless we're, they're widely available, affordable, and democratized, we won't see the quick and dramatic shifts towards sustainability that are really necessary. And so for that reason, scale is one of the priorities at Ecovative. We've found a way to scale up that's far faster and we believe is more sustainable than building a bunch of new mycelium farms. Uh, late last year, we began integrating our technology within third-party mushroom farms, starting with Whitecrest Mushrooms, uh, which is located in Putnam, Ontario. Uh, with some slight adjustments, uh, they are able to grow our materials within their existing farms. In that case, it's for food, uh, but at the same time, by adjusting some of the environmental conditions, the mushroom species and strains that we use, this process can be adapted to growing elastomeric foams or leather-like hides. This proves that we can replicate our process anywhere and marks a step towards truly distributed biomaterials manufacturing. Also, anything that we learn from the process of installing and running our air mycelium platform in other farms really helps to inform and improve our technology overall and accelerating our time to market with lots of products. We operate in what we call our mycelium foundry. And one of the important components of our foundry is driven by collaborations. And so today in the fashion industry, when we're developing our leather-like materials, as an example, we're working with leading fashion brands from Wolverine Worldwide to bestseller, whose feedback is really critical in designing and refining the materials that will eventually ship them for commercial products. Partners and suppliers, suppliers tell us what qualities are important to their material needs. And our team compares our vast network of mycelium strains to see if we can meet those needs by leveraging an array of growth chambers or incubators that are no bigger than a mailbox. So relatively fine and small and allows us to do high throughput research. All of the learnings that come through our foundry are directly plugged into our scaled farms, uh, which is the process steps that you can see here. And so the potential impact for each innovation increases as we adapt new strains to our scaled processes. We strive for efficiency in these processes so we can provide the best materials in the shortest amount of time, which is key as we have more and more pressing needs for sustainable materials these days. Last year, we announced that we're building the largest my aerial mycelium farm in the world. And at Ecovator, we're now weeks away from formally commissioning that. It's right across the street from where I'm sitting right now. Meanwhile, of course, we're out multiplying that output by partnering with mushroom farms. And so, of course, it wasn't long ago to, that if you heard someone claim that you could do all of this with mushrooms, uh, their minds would just be blown. And But now it really seems like it's a matter of fact, and we're seeing a lot more organizations and research going into this field. But it's also a function of more and more people learning about the incredible untapped power of the fungal kingdom and their countless life enriching environmentally beneficial applications. Mycelium represents many possibilities that are still yet to be explored, not just for fashion, apparel and food, but also many that we're hearing about today in medicine, environmental remediation, building construction, you name it. And so on the material side, we're expecting that within the next five years, mycelium will become a common feature of many industries. People are paying more attention to plastics, factory farming and other unsustainable practices of modern life. And mycelium is all about transformation and change. So while it will take time to remake longstanding industries for the better, I think fungi is tru are truly providing an incredibly powerful partner to solving this global need. And with that, I really appreciate your time today and I'm looking forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you so much, Gavin. That's just, it's so exciting, <laughs> all that you're doing there. Um, Fantastic. And so now we uh, are excited to hear from Craig Johnston from Plenitude. So Plenitude is utilizing fungi as a future food source, uh, a mycoprotein and bioplastic. And I can't wait to hear more about their work. So Craig. Hi there, everyone. Um, and greetings. Uh around the world from uh, Scotland. So Enough is a food tech company established uh, seven years ago. Um, and we make uh, very sustainable protein. Um, and I'm also gonna talk today about Plenitude, which is a large uh, collaborative uh, project. Um, so simply our process, um, we take uh, sugars from grains. We uh, have continuous fermentation of fungi and the biomass is, is, our, is our food. 
Um, and we use that in very simple recipes to make uh, delicious, nutritious, and most importantly, sustainable uh, food. And I'll show you some of the examples uh, later on. A key part of our um, process is the fact that we have a zero waste process. So we have a patented zero waste process. Um, so we have no uh, waste from the, from the process. So in terms of our product, um, high in amino acids, high in uh, protein, high in, high in fiber, um, and very um, flexible in terms of, uh, you know, of how it can be, how it can be used. So here are um, some examples um, of our of our material, and I guess the the fusarium that, that we use has a natural uh, structure. So you can see in in the in the chicken there, you know, fibrous uh, nature according to the hyphae. Um, so we control that um, you know quite precisely. Um, we've also done some work in other uh, you know other materials. You know, Gavin alluded you know alluded to some. Our primary focus is on on food as a business to, to business uh, company. Um, and I guess one of the really exciting things are vegan recipes, you know, are very, uh, very straightforward. So uh, microprotein, no further processing, no extrusion like you might have for other, um, you know, plant proteins and very uh, simple uh, recipes and great, great to cook with. And, and a range of, uh, you know, products there, including uh, um, some bacon, Gavin, but our primary market is looking really at, you um, you know, looking at uh, chicken and uh, you know and beef, and working with a whole range of uh, partners, uh, commercial partners, to bring these uh, bring these to market. So I'm going to talk um, a little about uh, collaboration, um, and we are um, part of a BBIJU, so bio-based industry joint undertaking. So this is a Horizon 2020 initiative in Europe. Interestingly, in the context of this discussion, it has been renamed as a circular uh, bio-based economy uh, recently. Um, and unlike uh, Phil's project, which was um, you know, more uh, research, fascinating, this project um, is called a flagship project. So this is about helping build uh, world first uh, facilities. Um, so there are 14 of these type projects uh, funded in, uh, in the EU and they range from insect farming to extracting sugar from wood through bioprocess and this is our uh, plenitude um, project and it's a great uh, collaboration so enough is the project uh, coordinator we have Wageningen as the uh, research partner and a range of um, small SMEs small medium enterprises and large companies um, across the value chain so there's a range of companies that you may have heard of or may not um, have heard of. So um, Cargo, they are the landlords for the facility. I will show you our, our great facility um, shortly. They provide services and they provide raw materials. And crucially, for the sustainability of our process, um, they recycle um, our waste through a secondary process. Um, Vivera, um, so a plant-based uh, Dutch company. So they're a um, selling products to the market and looking to use our uh, microprotein. Um, ABP, and this is really an interesting um, company. So that's, um, you know, Anglo Beef. So it's a beef company, a traditional company, looking to um, plant-based protein as they see um, the trend for these types of types of products. Um, flavorings, IFF. Lactips, I'll talk about in a bit more detail uh, shortly. So they're a French company who make uh, bioplastics. And um, in the context discussion, I will um, go into that in a little bit more de detail. LCE um, are an Italian organization who look at um, life cycle analysis. So traditional um, you know, CO2 emissions, land use, water use, but also one of the really interesting parts of the research is looking at um, the social impact. And you know, our products will reduce the the need for you know for animal farming so the tradition transition and the just transition is something that we are um, working on you know very you know very closely um Mozambique, many people will know as um creating in the laboratory the first uh, uh lab grown meat so there's a range of cultured meat um, companies uh globally and they're all looking to uh scale up and we're working with uh, moza to look at um, options 
including uh, recycling of streams into their into their media and also how um, how fungi potentially could play a role as a, as a structure within the within the cultured uh, domain. We also look at 3D printing, which is another you know another uh, area in, in food where um, there's very interesting aspects associated potentially with the structural uh, property of our of our material. And Bridge to Foods have helped organize uh, the event in terms of our communication uh, partner. So this project, um, we received um, just under 17 million euros from uh, BBIJU, and it runs for five and a half years. So we're we're midway midway through, and the lion's share of that um, of that funding helped contribute to to the factory that we're building um, in the Netherlands. I guess this project and other projects, and also the discussions uh, today really highlight um, you know, the importance of uh, bio-based uh, value chains, um, really looking at everything from the, from the crops, the supply, through the processing, through the conversion, into storage distribution, um, and then into the, you know, into the shops. And all of these stages have, uh, you know, have sustainability and uh, options for, you know, for recycle. So the typical products that could be made uh, with uh, mycoprotein, this is not an exhaustive list, um, classical uh, meat alternatives. Um, there's some interest in, in meat hybrids. So this is blending uh, meat and uh, mycoprotein. Uh, pet food, I know there's a range of uh, companies um, in the uh, vegan pet food ma market. Then moving to other applications, so dairy, noodles, other ways of uh, presenting uh, protein and, uh, and clean meat. Um, as I said, um, we have a, an excellent partner um, called Lactips from, from France who work on uh, bioplastics, traditionally from uh, whey protein. Um, but there's some examples there of work that they're doing uh, with us in terms of you know, understanding uh, the performance of microprotein um, as a bioplastic. So there's a range of challenges you know, there, um, largely associated with, with, the, with the structure um, of the material um, and different um, options are available to try and modify that. So that's one really interesting you know, area where uh, microprotein um, can be used. Um, we've also seen some you know, applications you know, for leather and, and other areas. Um, so I think the, the list is, you know, is growing and we're very much focused at the moment on uh, delivery of our, of, our, of our facility and uh, making these uh, products. So let me talk about the, our, our facility and, and much, much uh, like uh, Gavin talked about, we're just about to commission um, our um, facility in the south of the Netherlands. So it's on the border between the Netherlands and, um, and Belgium, a place called Sas van Ghent. Um, and there is an image um, of, our, of our facility. Um, so this will produce initially um, 10,000 tonnes. Of, of protein growing to 60,000 tons of protein. So the largest facility of its type um, globally. Um, and we're really, really excited um, about this. The product will come onto the market um, at the end of the year. Um, we've also had a fantastic um, construction uh, project. Um, so the picture there is the groundbreaking, which was on the 16th of September last year. Um, and we plan to be cutting the ribbon on the 16th of September this year. So the process itself is based on fermentation at the tall part of the building, then subsequent um, processing um, and uh, isolation of the paste. But I think the key thing, if you look at the little diagram, the map uh, from Google map, um, the enough facility is in the, in the middle. Um, so we take feed directly um, from cargo. So we take our glucose supply you know, directly, there's no uh, transportation. Um, and then the, the effluent that we make, so this is an aqueous stream with small amounts of uh, sugar and um, fiber, goes through a secondary fermentation uh, process to convert to ethanol um, and animal feed. So that happens within the cargo uh, facility. So it's a, a fully circular um, process. So we're very, you know, proud of that. And because of that um, process, it, it um, makes us produce most sustainable um, protein. So as I said, the initial capacity 10,000 tons expanding up to uh, 60,000 tons. 
Our mission is to produce 1 million tonnes of protein by 2032. So we're very much focused on that. And the footprint um, will extend you know, from, from Europe. We're looking uh, in North America, we're looking in the Gulf, we're looking in Asia. So our footprint uh, you know, will grow. And it's really interesting to see some of the activities in different uh, locales uh, today. So really just to one of the key parts um, of this and uh, Luke is working for, for enough is in terms of the impact and the societal impact. Um, so 1 million tons of Abunda that I mentioned is uh, 5 million less uh, cows to grow intensively, uh, 6 million less tons of CO2. And then when you look compared with the animal in terms of water usage, um, it's significant reduction. There are other types of uh, you know, pulses, other types of um, you know, plant proteins um, that can be used. In some cases, we, we, we use our product with these, but this is what would deliver um, significant uh, societal and sustainability uh, impact. So we're very proud of this as our, as our core uh, mission. So um, with that, I'll conclude. And it's very much about changing what we eat not the way we eat. So thanks very much and look forward to answering questions later. Fantastic. Thank you, Craig. And thank you to Anath and their whole team for convening this fabulous panel. And so uh, with that, the moment, uh, now that we know a bit more about what some of these incredible companies uh, are working on, we are going to uh, begin the panel discussion. And so uh, I would invite all of the panelists to uh, turn on your video if you like. And we've actually collect, we've been collecting questions that have been popped into the chat. So I will um, get started with a question for, for all of the panelists. Uh, so the first question, uh, what types of things do you have to consider or take special care of when manufacturing or even maintaining fungal-based products? In other words, what kind of fundamental problems do you have to overcome when manufacturing your prototypes? Um, I could just say for, for us, uh, we're dealing with really dirty materials. And so just um, engineering for what we can control. So we're not layering in more process and more um, energy usage into it. And so that's always been the challenge for us. And we just take into the fundamental considerations of how we develop our bulk treatment, but then, you know, depth analysis, uh, respiration of the mycelium, um, taking account for all of that leveling up as we move from, you know, lab into ton scale, which is where we are now. I, I uh, following on from, uh, following on from Joanna, um, <clears throat> one of the key things for, for us is, um, you know, contamination uh, and then also consistency. And uh, of course, you know, when you're, when you're in the lab and working making prototypes at lab scale, that's one thing. But if you're targeting the idea of, you know, trying to grow monolithic architecture, um, you know, this, this takes you to a completely other set of scales uh, where suddenly all sorts of variables come into play and the risk of contamination and the um, efforts to try and control consistency become really, really um, poignant. You know, you just, so for, for example, at the moment, we're, we're just in the process of trying to make a prototype of our construction concept, which is about two meters tall, um, two meters wide, and maybe about half a meter thick. And in the space that we're actually trying to um, cultivate this, you know, we've got a temperature differential between you know, the ground and the top that might be in, in the Danish summer, close to 10 degrees. And that starts to have a, you know, a real impact on consistency. So, I mean, these, these are some of the kind of key things when we're starting to think about um, issues when, when looking at architectural scale. Yeah. Sorry, Gavin. I... Yeah. Maybe it's Craig here. I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, you know, say a few words. We're making a food 
Um, so food safety, you know, is is clearly uh, number one priority. So my, managing uh, mycotoxins is a you know is an issue. So we are our, our, our organism can work in a whole range of substrates. Um, but one of the key key issues is making sure we have a you know a, a pure substrate, you know, controlling the conditions so there's no uh, you know mycotoxin production. So I would say that's one key thing we're regulated. So um, through with the FDA, uh, EFSA in, in Europe. So the the food safety aspect I would say is important. Thanks, Craig. And yeah. Gavin, did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I'll, I'll weigh in here uh, with, with our experience in this space. So first, I think it's critically important to select the right mycelium species and then strain based on your application. That's critically important. And just like we're all different humans, you can't assume that all the same strains within an individual species will behave the same. And so it's about designing your processes that really elevate the individual strain that you're using for your application. And Phil, I'd love to help you uh, solve some of your challenges with contamination. We've, we've lived that, and I think we've got a lot of wisdom we can share there uh, as we've been able to demystify and distribute the production of mycocomposite and mycelium materials, inclusive of work in the field. And so uh, de designing for the individual and selecting the individual, and by individual, I mean the right strain for your application, critically important. Would any of the other panelists like to add on to that question? Okay, so actually, um, we have a couple questions that really naturally follow from this, this last question. So uh, one of uh, our participants actually asked, well, how do you choose which strains you work with? And so it builds on um, on Gavin's point there about the importance of picking uh, not only a species and strain. So, and I'm personally very curious about this too. I was kind of excited to see that, you know, at Plenitude at, at Enough, um, you're using uh, Fusarium, right? Yeah. Craig? Yeah, so that's good, you know, that's kind of yeah. cool. It's a less charismatic fungus in a sense. So, so I'll put that question to the entire panel. Um, how do you pick the species and the strains that you work with? Well, I'll, I'll start since you, you mentioned that originally, Daniel. So, so Fusarium has been has been used for in food applications, you know, since the late eighties. Um, so we choose to use the uh, the same strain um, in terms of easing the process of introducing uh, food to the market. Other companies have gone for more novel strains and then have to go through you know a different uh, you know a different process. We are looking at uh, you know novel strains. You know, for future, you know, applications, but ours was a kind of pragmatic decision of, um, you know, picking a strain that there had been a, you know, a, a history of. From, for us, from the, oh, sorry, go ahead, Joanne. Sorry, Gavin. I was just going to say, for us, it's um, it's a matter of training on substrate, and um, and taking cues from nature. Uh, so s seeing what's growing where, and then uh, replicating and expanding from there. Uh, to, to build off Joanne's point, I think uh, uh, identifying the strains that grow within your geography is really important because they're already attuned to the environment in which you're cultivating. Oftentimes our scientists, if we're looking at a new substrate, will go into the field and isolate individuals from that raw material. They already have the enzymatic toolkit that's required in order to, to work within that space. Um, the other thing that's really interesting that we've found, and this is what we call the forager secret, is the mushroom can be a really good leading indicator. Of course, Fusarium doesn't produce a mushroom, it's an ascomycete, but for basidiomycetes and certain ascomycetes, uh, that is a great directional uh, sense. So for example, you can find something that's tough and tenacious. I don't know if you can hear this. Uh, this is a particular fungus whose mycelium actually results in something that has a comparable strength to wood. Pretty impressive, and it doesn't have the vasculature of a tree. Uh, or you can select something that has really low density, and this is all from the fruiting body initially, but also provides the elastomeric characteristics you'd come to find for uh, foam. In food, we're focused on using gourmet mushroom species and the mycelium of those species, because if you're looking at something like a leather-like textile, if you try to eat this, it's not going to hurt you, uh, but you're going to be chewing on it for a really long time before it actually breaks down. And so that too is an area where 
we can learn from society, we can learn from nature and really allow nature to do the heavy lift and legwork for us so we can focus our time and attention on where we can make the most impact at scale. Thanks, Gavin. Yeah, I just, I love that at Ecovative you identify native strains uh, growing regionally. I think it's it's personally been really interesting to see you know, fungal species and strains isolated from, you know, nuclear reactors and electronic waste and all of these other incredibly <laughs> harsh environments. So um, thank you for raising these points and, you know, and, and also to Joanne for bringing up the potential to, to train fungi. So you can identify fungi that are already capable of tolerating these wastes or environments or different substrates. And then you can also further uh, enhance their ability to, to do that. And also, you know, thank you to Craig again. I just kind of love, I feel like even though Fusarium is, as you say, been part of our uh, food industry, really, a really important part. And it's part of so many products uh, over the last decades, it's not as uh, well known or maybe appreciated. Um, and so I'd like to move now actually into a question that Joanne put out. And I think it's a, a really interesting one. There were a few questions that sort of um, asked the panelists about some of the, of the, of the challenges or barriers in, in this space. So in um, innovating within, within this field and within this space, uh, there, you know, these may be policy barriers or regulatory barriers or other barriers. So Joanne asked, how have you addressed testing mycelium-based products uh, for use in architectures? This was uh, to Phil specifically. Uh, and Joanne said, traditional standards don't necessarily apply to bio-based products. Are you working to advocate for new standards or engineering for outcomes that are comparable to building materials and systems already in the market. Uh, so maybe Phil, if you'd like to, to, to speak to this question and I'd love to invite the other panelists to speak to their experiences with this as well. Sure, so I mean, in, in terms of the, the testing that we've been doing, um, clearly there, there are no standards that kind of look to mycelium-based composites. Um, so therefore what we're looking at are the kind of nearest possible um, ISO standards for things that might be like particle board um, or for um, two-phase composites, for example, uh, and then following the standards for testing there. Um, I mean, one of the things we're also finding across the literature is that cur currently there is really no kind of standardization, you know, that pe people, people are using all sorts of different standards and therefore it makes it very difficult to compare results. Um, particularly for um, you know, me mechanical properties um, in, in this field. Um, but uh, I mean, certainly um, I can also see that as, as we start to approach um, an interest, perhaps not just working with um, denatured organism, but living organisms and starting to think about how they might have a role in our built environment uh, in our product environment, in our design environments, there will have to be completely new standards that are, are, are produced for them. Um, uh, you know, and it, this this you know just opens up a kind of really exciting field, but also, as Joanna points to, is is really a a, a critical barrier in terms of ro rolling these things out. Thank you for that. I just actually had talked to uh, uh, William McDonough of Cradle to Cradle Institute through um, the, the Circulars and World Economic Forum and a, a discussion about how to start to change the landscape to allow for these materials to be used and even considered. And part of that does come in trying to meet that, that ISO or ASTM. Um, but I'd love to see even from this discussion uh, wider collaboration so we can start to influence this uh, and the performance standards. You know, I know that that Gavin and his team has done, they have done some initial testing on the insulation products and the board products. Um, I think to start to collaborate and say, okay, how do we start to talk to ISO, um, you know, as organizationally about the need to incorporate this. So we, as we build 
out our processes over the next uh, several years, there's a, a soft landing for us to implement this and to have true impact into building an architecture. Here, here, Joanne, totally. The, the industry is the one that directs and guides these standards and sits on these committees. And we do need to uh, make a, a clear stance ourselves and uh, make sure we carve out a position for the next generation of these standards, 100%. And maybe speaking from from a food side, um, so we were working with a range of the microprotein uh, companies, um, really to you know to 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 come together. Um, that's already happening in the in the cellular space. Um, perhaps that's more challenging in terms of the you know in terms of regulation, um, but we're looking to looking to come to together. One other reason as a challenge, um, Danielle, is is uh, capital and fermentation uh, capacity in our case. Um, we're at aqueous fermentation, not uh, solid state, as was as was described. And if you look at the projections for um, you know for, for uh, fermented protein, uh, you need um, one of our plants every two and a half days. So one of the plants that I just showed every two and a half days to, to cope with the the the, de the demand uh, growth. So the the availability of fermentation capacity is a is a key issue we've used. There was one question on, on the chat about um, access to facilities. So when we started off, uh, we used open access uh, facilities, both for laboratory and then for uh, for scale up. So there are these uh, uh, open access uh, facilities that are around, and there are you know funding uh, for for startups to you know to get going. Fantastic, thank you. So uh, there's there's just so much engagement. It's it's wonderful to see. So I'm trying to group questions together into themes uh, so we can cover a, a lot of ground. Um, and so I think I'll just give a final opportunity. There were additional questions in this sort of theme of, of challenges um, in this space. And so there was a question about, you know, have you experienced any pushback from legacy industries? Um, as you're bringing mycelium products to market and how have you addressed that? Um, and then there was a question as well, sort of um, touches into what Craig was just speaking to about some of the um, challenges of funding or monetizing these mycelium-based solutions. So I'll just want to provide an opportunity for um, the panelists to maybe add anything. Have you experienced any pushback as you're sort of with your groundbreaking um, solutions and and new products and and new ways of doing things and and you know have you how have you how have you uh, monetized this and uh, you know do you have any advice for others who may want to um, you know carve out a similar path and monetize a mycelium based company. <laughs> This really touches a nerve for me, Danielle, because I mean, we're in two tough industries. Um, <sighs> what I will say is um, fermentation's not new. We eat bread, we drink beer, we make wine and cheese. And so we're already using these practices at scale. The scalability issue um, should be a non issue. Um, and then, you know, using a biological and controlling it, I mean, Pretty much everybody here has taken penicillin before, you know. We take we take supplements, um, so these become like non barriers for me, and I just address it in just a common sense discussion to say that we've already been doing these things. It's just maybe a different input. Ours is trash, um, or a different output. You know, Craig's is food. Um, we have to just be very practical and maybe get out of our way sometimes in the way that we communicate this. I mean, I just break it down. We're training mushrooms to eat trash to create new materials. Um, if we get too sciencey with the business realm, we won't get, there, there won't be funding that comes into it. Um, as someone in their seed round right now, I mean, we're mid-raise, uh, we're doing well, but I'll tell you that there is a lot of skepticism from folks that look at this and they say, well, what's the true value and impact to climate change? I'm, I'd rather just say, what isn't, right? We can chip away at this uh, very rapidly using nature-based technology. It, are, it already works. So we're just applying it in a controlled manner. Yeah, so I, I maybe just make just a sort of general comment. So I'm a chemical engineer, you know, by background, so it's very much a kind of systems uh, systems approach. 
but um, you know, advice for people starting, you know, companies is really just to stick to the basics. You know, what are the raw material costs? What are the transformation, you know, costs? And also, what what's the selling price? Yeah. So it's these are the, you know, it's relatively straightforward. But what also is, you know, how much does it cost to get to scale? And what are the economies of scale? So some processes, there's a real, you know, econ so for aqueous fermentation, for example, there's a real benefit of a, you know, economies of scale. So these would be the kind of four things I would just say to anyone in the audience to, you know, to look at. They're fairly straightforward, but I've seen many, you know, business plans. I, I peer review um, uh, various kind of competitions and, you know, sometimes just the basic, you know, people might identify the market size, but you've got to focus on how much it costs to make. And what are you going to sell it for? Fairly straightforward. <laughs> I, I agree with Craig and, uh, and, and Joanne. And to build off those key points, uh, one of the key drivers is getting to scale. And so oftentimes what the incumbents are already doing is they're operating at scale and they want to actually see the operations at scale before they're willing to make a meaningful investment. Uh, that certainly puts a lot of onus on the entrepreneur. Uh, but as we've touched on today, I think all of our organizations are making meaningful strides to meeting that ultimate scale and demonstrating those economics, as Craig mentioned. And from there, I think we'll have greater and broader opportunities. So, so from, from, from an architectural perspective, perhaps, you know, the, the biggest pushback is, is one about societal acceptance. Um, you know, that there's a kind of sensibility in society um, ingrained through a kind of understanding that um, you know uh, what what makes a good environment and the idea of you know creating a fungal architecture is you know al almost you know obscene you know that fungus is something you're trying to keep out of your homes rather than trying to build them from uh, and so there you know it also begins to suggest a, a, a need for you know being able to educate society um, and and you know, bring them to towards you know an understanding that we can we can leverage fungus as a partner rather than trying to keep it as something that is um, detrimental to to your environment. Yes, great points. Um, thank you so much. So there were a number of questions as well, um, essentially around the theme of. How do how, you know how does fungal mycelium or uh, fruit bodies how do they compare uh, in their mechanical, physical, and other properties to their I guess industry standard product? So um, I think there's potential for many of you to to respond to this question. So how you know how do the fungal mycelium you know the products that you create how do they compare to the sort of uh, industry standard products in their properties. So uh, from, from our perspective, in terms of uh, getting a product into the, into the market, uh, one, first and foremost, you have to be economically competitive. Uh, when you're particularly displacing a, uh, an entrenched and commodity product, it's an economic decision before it's a sustainability decision. And I think that's still true today, even though we've made a lot of progress as, as society. From a mechanical performance perspective, I think one of the attributes of mycelium that's unique is that we can intentionally design materials. And so it's not about just doing a one-to-one -one substitution of that product, but redesigning that product in order to leverage the capabilities of mycelium and provide added value to that end customer. Um, and so that's something that I think is, is critically important to consider. And then the other aspect is you have to understand too, not just where the material goes in terms of its final application, but all the touch points that come along the way. And you have to understand who the stakeholders are within that value chain and what other kind of values or needs they may have. And so the identifying the right problem is really critical to addressing a broader need because if it goes to a supplier and they don't wanna use it, but the brand wants it, it's likely gonna be dead on the, on the vine. So it's something to pay attention to. Thanks, Gavin. Is, would anyone else like to add something on that question about how your product compares to sort of- Yeah, I'll, I'll, 
works. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick, pick that up because we, we do uh, uh, lots of work in terms of developing you know, fantastic recipes for chicken. And the way that we is by taste testing. So taste testing alongside um, you know, other meat alternatives and taste testing you know, alongside, uh, alongside uh, chicken. Um, one of one of the, the well, this is a just a little you know vignette. We were we were we had some of our products in a show in uh, San Francisco you know recently, and we actually had a complaint to the hotel that they were they had served real chicken. Um, so that was you know it's just kind of proof in terms of the of the product that we're you know that we're making. That's existing format. So that's our that's our business you know now. But one one of the interesting thing is how should we, as a food you know how should you know fungus be, prevent, uh, be presented, you know, rather than just mimicking a, a piece of meat, how do we present that in the future? And that's something, you know, in the, in the years ahead, that I think will be, you know, that will, that will change rather than just replicating, uh, you know, meat formats that we have current. Real quick, from my perspective, our greatest challenge is the incumbent industry. It's easy to just throw your trash out and call it a day. Most people don't know where it goes. They don't care where it goes as long as it goes. And so my perspective has been, I don't want to be like the incumbent industry. I want to be better. And, and that, that might come at a longer uh, proving ground, but we have many multi-global partners that we're, we're building and scaling with right now. And I think that they're ultimately going to have something to say about this, right? That these are clients that use waste management, they're material producers, and so they can start to influence it. So I think you have to be very mindful in terms of performance to have all the, the stakeholders engage. At least that's been my MO to date. But it's hard when you're coming in uh, against something that's cheap and easy. And uh, so you just have to show value in a different way. And for us, it's you know not sacrificing the planet that we live on. Oh, wow. I wish we had more time. Thank you all so much for responding to these questions. There are so many more questions that I wish we could have gotten to. Um, there were some questions about sort of, you know, are you open to partnerships and do you offer any um, supports or resources or lab services? So I would, uh, I, I, I thought I heard each, each of you really uh, emphasize your the importance of collaboration and, and partnership and the many partnerships that you do engage in. So I would encourage the participants to really, you know, follow up, look into uh, the websites, uh, look into the available resources uh, from each of these incredible companies. And um, at this point, we uh, are going to welcome Peter McCoy, co-founder of Radical Mycology and founder of Mycolocos to give our closing remarks. Um, so thank you, Peter. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, excellent. Um, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, the slides are looking good, I'm hoping. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, many good things have been said, and obviously these um, industries of these applications of mycelium, really, uh, to put it simply, is um, more explosive than I could have imagined. You know, many years ago when I first got really excited about the potential of you know microremediation as a as a youngster. Um, so to see how how far the science has come and the innovations um, is not only inspiring, but also um, kind of just speaks to the reality that we're sort of looking at a whole new, you know, wild west, if you will, of, of, a, of an untapped science, a whole world of unknown unknowns. And so, you know, some of the things I was hearing today, you know, was dropping my jaw and hopefully a lot of people in the audience as well. Um, and that's just at the beginning, I think, as you know, I think Gavin said, you know, we're really at the beginning, even though they've been working on this and their work for 15 years, they probably definitely realize, as all of us do, um, that we're just scratching the surface and probably don't really understand uh, what we're getting into in the long run. Um, but hopefully it's all, all for the good. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to speak so much about the, the technologies and things. Um, these people are all doing uh, really great work. Uh, my, my work folks that aren't necessarily familiar, um, largely revolves around education. And, you know, part of that is some trying to be inspiring and insightful and just provide ways of thinking about 
uh, sort of the bigger picture for me, it's always interesting to ask, you know, the, the why, why are we doing these things? Sustainability obviously is, is a good reason, um, but also, you know, what motivates us in doing this work so that it is personally sustainable. And so, you know, burnout is a reality of doing any work, um, especially something that is so challenging and, um, and where you're just feeling like you're constantly trying to really create a whole new wheel and innovating is fun, but really intimidating and tiring it can be. Um, but also can be exhilarating when you have those breakthroughs. So what are some of the ways to stay motivated in that process and also, um, you know, hopefully inspiring for other people along the way. And, you know, I try to apply that to my own work and pass on some insights I've gleaned over the years to others. And a lot of the lessons I get and have gotten have been directly from the fungi themselves. Um, you may have heard or thought on your own um, that fungi are pretty inspiring as organisms on a lot of fronts, and there's many ways to see them as sort of role models for living sustainably. And, you know, what, for me, working with them over the years, lots of questions come from, you know, literally, what can I learn from studying them, working with them, cultivating them? Um, they are so resilient in the natural world. How can I apply some of their modes and habits to my human way of engaging with the world? And what could that look like? whether literally or metaphorically or uh, philosophically or something like this. And so these for the just last few minutes are some of the, a few of my sort of top lessons, if you will, I've gotten from fungi that definitely apply to the applications we heard about today, but I think really more broadly to the future of applied micro technologies, um, the future of applied mycological science, and really the future of the modern microculture, if you will, all the ways that humans engage with fungi and our relationships to them, whether as um, applied organisms and things like this, or things that we um, cultivate in our homes or just forage in the wild and, again, are inspired by and reminded about, you know, the brilliance of nature and the importance of protecting and preserving it. So one of the first and um, one that's sort of been brought up a couple times, I think, in, in various ways uh, today, or maybe underpinning a lot of this, is the resilience of fungi and just their ability to, you know, I guess uh, the, the training notion comes along with this. This is this idea that fungi being introduced, some, some fungi better than others, introduced to a food they'd never encountered before, will either learn to adapt to eat that or, or die. And in many cases, and some of the, with many of the fungi that are used in these industries, um, they're quite good at that ad adaptation and bouncing back. This is something we find throughout the uh, fossil record and, and a lot of the ecological principles and relationships that fungi form in the environment is based on their own inherent resiliency and ability to sort of counteract a lot of obstacles, but also their ability to provide and pass on some of the resilience to those they partner with. And so in observing that, there's inspiration that can come. You know, one way I like to think about that training notion, that ability for, you know, throwing some oil at a oyster mushroom and seeing what it does with it is that in the long run, if it learns to eat it, it's finding that answer within itself, even though, you know, maybe the, the Haifa thought it was this crazy impossible thing at first, it eventually figured it out. And I think that's where we are heading as researchers, as a global community, as we're facing, you know, many, many challenges. And I don't think we're just gonna, right, throw in the towel and give up, but continue to push forward, um, hopefully in strong allyship with our, our fungal partners. Um, I think you can take that many ways and the notion of resiliency definitely nowadays goes more and more in hand with sustainability, um, but it really is a big, ever more present and um, prescient concept as we face even more increasing, uh, especially environmental challenges that we have to be prepared for the worst case scenarios. Um, hopefully they, we can dodge them, but if we can't, how will we and everything we engage with bounce back from that? Um, in the long run. Fungi have a lot to offer, um, both as models, but also as, again, as we've started to see some as, you know, applic applied organisms. Um, another great lesson is just the, the realization that fungi are explorers. So they, um, they pioneer extreme environments. Um, a study came out a couple of years ago showing, at least in a lab setting, but probably applies in many uh, real world scenarios that in a in an arid environment and a dry environment mycelium comes first channels in the water and then bacteria follow behind them so we can we see that applied in many um, uh, examples historically 
throughout the sort of evolution of Earth, but also we see that in uh, modern environments, extreme environments, going back to that ad adaptability, the resiliency, fungi can take on new challenges, but also are incredibly exploratory and finding new ways to adapt. They're, uh, again, incredible teachers in this way of taking on new challenges, going into uncharted territory and sort of figuring out what can work for them, but also all those around them that they work with. Um, fungi, you know, no Haifa is an island. It all works in concert with the ecosystem that it's enmeshed in and really underpins it. It is that egg. It is the, uh, you know, the tie that binds it all together. The mycelium is so many things. But a big part of that role they play is not just in connecting, but in, in sort of tapping into new places and taking us uh, where we've never been before, as we're, as we're starting to see. Uh, obviously, there is a sort of a will and a spirit, maybe you could say it to the mycelium in this way, uh, one that we can embody ourselves, both as casual observers or as uh, researchers and experimenters like those on today's panel. Um, as many people uh, has come up, uh, mentioned a couple times on this panel, you know, a really great notion that comes along with working with fungi and observing them is this idea of collaboration and the importance of it um, in the natural world and in pretty much everything that fungi do, you know, even in their roles of, of hurting, if you will, other organisms, we can see that it's sort of collaborative in the whole ecology um, in the long run because they're often sort of helping mediate the spread of diseases, say from one tree to another by sort of weaning it off. And we can apply these adaptation strategies by looking at, say, waste stream industries that are you know, harmful in one respect um, to the environment, maybe working with them via fungi to you know, create a, a solution out of the problem. And that's just one example. Um, there's obviously the collaboration of you know, the people involved in this panel, people in the audience working with them and whatnot, but also people in the audience working with their friends, colleagues, peers, students, teachers, um, you know, children to explore not only the things that have been mentioned today, but all the other unknown unknowns. Again, with this such, such a vast future of fungi before us, um, we're only going to get to to you know ever greater heights through trying new things, exploring, and working with other people, and bringing in people with outside perspectives. Um, so much of of innovation is pioneered by the outsider, the person with the fresh eyes who doesn't necessarily follow a dogma related to the the topic. And we need that in applied mycology, um, people that you know come in uh, bringing their own background, but also maybe don't have um, yeah, a set of beliefs around that contamination will always happen in this way. And why don't we try it this other way? Something like this. And uh, lastly, you know, of, of the many lessons we might look at, um, I think a very important one, one that I try to carry myself is just this notion of humility. You know, fungi are incredibly ancient, um, arguably the first largest or complex, larger celled organisms were fungi or something like them. And we descend from them. Um, they are you know, potentially billions of years old and, and carry a lot of wisdom in this way and have done so much to shape the world and continue to inform it. And in as much as we come in with our opposable thumbs and prefrontal cortex and um, sciences, uh, there's still a lot to learn. And there's still a lot we don't know about these organisms and, and, and ways to work with them properly. And so as multiple people have mentioned, uh, thankfully, you know, a, a huge first step in working with fungi appropriately is through observation and learning you know, from them seeing what's growing around you um, rather than trying to say, take a protocol off the shelf and say, you know, you know what's gonna work best going in blind. And so we just generally need that, I think in life, um, but definitely in, in this really unexplored world, um, slowing down, you know, maybe not bulldozing into it, working impulses and, and, you know, taking a little breather and maybe stepping back and trying to see the, the big picture uh, not just of the given experiment, but again, sort of these bigger why, why are we doing this? And is this the right direction overall that we should be taking this science? Um, as with so many, you know, new fields, there's so many ways that applied mycology could, you know, go, go good or bad. It's a tool like anything other, uh, anything else or any technology can be used for good or for bad. Um, so, you know, making sure that we're our, the, sort of the broader community of applied mycologists have a good ethos, um, and that our sort of intentions are in the right direction. You know, economic incentive is, is certainly valuable in that to, to keep it sustainable. Um, but overall, what's the trajectory? And, um, you know, would the, would the fungi approve? Uh, might be a good question. 
Um, so I'll leave it at that. Just a hopefully a few helpful closing thoughts. And I just want to thank again, Luke and the team for bringing me on. Give me a few words to, to throw around and um, yeah, leave it at that. Thank you. And yeah, uh, here's a, a website. If you want to check out the work that I get into. Thank you, Peter, for uh, closing us off with a few words of wisdom, really, and lessons from the fungi. I think it's a great way to end this panel. Um, thank you all for joining from all around the world. I will pop up the contact information uh, for all of our panelists uh, so we can end on that note by uh, giving you ways to connect and learn more and follow up with all these incredible speakers and leaders. Um, the recording will be emailed to registered participants as well. And you can also rewatch this entire thing on Facebook. Um, and so with that, again, thank you for joining. Thank you to our panelists. Um, and thank you to, to our hosts at Enough and Plentitude. <laughs>